Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. I needed a week off from recording to enjoy the waning days of summer here in Buffalo, New York with my daughter. So this episode is a bit different because I am not in the host seat. My pal Michael Van Hardingsveld, who has appeared on several episodes of this podcast, reached out saying he had befriended a PhD candidate who studies alongside him under Dr. Sherry Fowler at the University of Kansas, whom he was interested in speaking to as a graduate student meets graduate student conversation about navigating the world of PhDs, studying East Asian art, teaching, and more. So I love the idea of a rising second year PhD student, my friend Michael, interviewing a PhD candidate in his field and department, Rachel Quist, about the lifestyles that they navigate towards a life in scholarship. And if I may, I'd like to offer a brief introduction of the two discussants on this episode. Michael Van Hardingsveld has worn many hats, including becoming a friend of mine. After receiving an undergraduate degree in English language and literature, he moved to South Korea in 2011 to work as a teacher at an English immersion school. While there, he became enamored with the religious art of East Asia. He finished a master's degree in East Asian art and its markets from Claremont Graduate University in 2017, after which he worked for two years as an Asian art collections specialist at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Michael has collaborated with the Los Angeles Office of the Japan Foundation in the curation of three exhibitions and two public lecture series. Two of the exhibitions showcase the Gyotaku art of Dwight Huang, who appeared as a guest on episode 92 of Classical Ideas. Michael's guest on this episode is Rachel Quist. Rachel specializes in East Asian Buddhist imagery with focuses in pre-modern Japan and China. Her research centers on questions of interaction with imagery, materiality, and object agency, and the accessibility of image-based practices. She has written on topics such as Buddhist reliquary design and expressivity, the didactic project underlying hell tableaus, and the construction of a collective memory surrounding the Shingon monk Kobo Daishi at the temple complex of Mount Koya. Rachel is currently conducting research on early imperial patronage of Daigoji, a Shingon temple in Kyoto, for her dissertation. Throughout this conversation, Rachel mentions various sites and articles and has included various links to me as supplementary material in my email, which I have included in the show notes if you would like to explore more of what she discusses. This is a wonderful conversation between two specialists of East Asian Buddhist art, and it was a joy for me to listen to their conversation about their lives. Without further delay, please enjoy this special conversation between KU PhD candidate Rachel Quist in discussion with colleague Michael Van Hardingsveld. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Van Hardingsveld, and you may remember me from three Classical Ideas episodes, one on Japanese Buddhist art in episode 47, one on Kyotaku in episode 92, which we did with Dwight Huang, and on enrolling in a PhD program in episode 107. Well, I'm back this time, but in the host seat, and I couldn't be more delighted. I am pleased that my classmate and fellow Japanese art enthusiast, Rachel Quist, has agreed to join me today. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Rachel is currently a PhD candidate at the Lawrence campus of the University of Kansas, where her major field of study is Japanese sculpture produced between the 8th and 14th centuries. If you want period names, that would be the Nara to Kamakura periods. Rachel is also interested in Buddhist sculpture of China from the Tang to Song dynasties and Japanese prints from the Edo period to the present. During her time as a graduate student, Rachel has taught as the instructor of record for the course Art and Culture of Japan, and as an instructor for the courses Modern Korean Art and Culture and Eastern Civilizations. She has also put in time as a lecture assistant for the courses Modern and Contemporary Visual Arts of Japan and American Art 1900 to 1945, Rise of Modernism. All that to say that Rachel has a working knowledge of many different sectors of cultural and art histories. Rachel has also received numerous awards for her academic achievements, including the Morris Family Art His History Scholarship, 
the Toshizo Watanabe Foundation Scholarship, the IUC Alumni Scholarship, and the Okubo Award. She is also a frequent recipient of the annual University of Kansas Foreign Language and Area Studies Award. In spring 2017, Rachel was granted the University of Kansas Award for Academic Excellence in Asian Art, a resplendent feather in an already impressive cap. Having studied with her for the past year, I can say with confidence that Rachel is an enthusiastic and thoughtful budding scholar, as well as an unending font of knowledge. I am excited to chat with her today and to share our musings with the listeners of the Classical Ideas podcast. So Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. And thank you for that very kind introduction. Oh, it was a pleasure to write that. It was um, <laughs> a lot of fun to just kind of read through it. And, uh, you know, it came together so organically because we've gotten to know each other over the past year. Um, you started many years ago. I started just the beginning of the last academic year. But I feel like we've grown in our friendship, but we've also grown as sort of um, compatriots in studying Japanese Buddhist art as well. Yeah, yeah. comrades on the front lines. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a really fun, and the, the knowledge is esoteric, but I feel like we've really, you know, you're, you're comrades in arms in, a, in the way that you've described it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and I think that um, a lot of the esotericism that draws us in is is often kind of overlooked or treated as too niche, but the fact that something that is so detailed and, and treated as so kind of lofty and uh, inaccessible has uh, appealed to so many people, I think that that shows the kind of value across the humanities of looking at the types of art that we look at, or images, I should say, looking at the types of images that we look at. Oh, definitely. And there's almost a sort of like demystifying the like, uh, it's demystifying the mystery of these things and making it more accessible by people who might not have that quote unquote esoteric knowledge um, and making it a way that can be easily understood. And for our, us, that means that we can delve really into the studies and really get into the thick of it. And then when we come out the other side, we've got a very easily palatable, very easily understood um, idea of how to present it to people. Yeah, absolutely. So I do have to ask, uh, getting into this conversation, when did you first get drawn to Asian art? Uh, was there like a single moment where you can clearly remember where the switch was flipped? Uh, I think of it as a kind of, uh, well, there is a, a switch flipping moment, but I think that growing up uh, in the Boston area, really laid some important groundwork because I had access to museums like the Museum of Fine Arts Boston uh, and the Gardner Museum, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And in addition to regular school field trips to these institutions, uh, which I was very lucky to have access to these trips, uh, I was also and still am also very lucky to have parents that are really engaged with uh, the importance of art. And so even if my school had not taken me to a single museum, my parents were regularly taking me and uh, my brother to the Museum of Fine Arts when we were growing up. And the MFA Boston has one of the most impressive collections of East Asian art outside of East Asia, just on a global scale. So I was incredibly, it was an incredible privilege to have access to that collection. And so visiting the MFA regularly as a child into, you know, high school and college age life, I already had a kind of basic visual familiarity with a lot of Asian art. Um, and when I went to uh, university uh, as an undergraduate, um, I, I noticed at the University of Texas that there was uh, all sorts of really amazing things that I could, I could learn about. Uh, but there was a big gap in terms of uh, East Asian art. And I thought, you know, if I can't look into that uh, as an art historian, it, in my undergraduate institution, perhaps there's a summer program where I can kind of get in a semester where I learn more about things that are not readily avail available to me at my undergraduate school. So I, uh, I took a summer program at Boston University, actually. It was nice because I got to be close to home uh, and <laughs> close to my favorite museums, but 
also I got to take a course there about Asian art history that um, it was a, an, a pretty extensive survey course. It was really, uh, really valuable in many ways. But there was this one specific uh, image that the teacher showed us one day, uh, which is called Shigisan Engi Emaki. Uh, it's a 12th century uh, hand, uh, paint, painted scroll um, that depicts the uh, origin story, so to speak, uh, the, the legendary origins of a temple called Chogoson Shiji. And the, the, the word engi or engi emaki, engi is kind of like a, a legendary origin and emaki refers to a painted scroll uh, or a painted image. And well, no, a painted scroll. Uh, and so the, the phenomenon of an engi is kind of a way for institutions like temples to share their legendary origins, their origin story with uh, potential believers uh, or um, with people that are already members of the, of the lay classes. And it often does literally convey the founding of a temple, but sometimes it can tell the story of an important figure within the founding of a temple. So the uh, Shigisan Engi Emaki is uh, a, a three-part uh, series of Emaki scrolls that tells the stories of a monk named Nyoren, who was an incredibly gifted uh, monk that uh, founded the temple Chogoson Shiji, which is located on a mountain called Shigisan. And... Um, all three of the stories are wonderful and the illustrations are stunning. They're done in this style that's a very dynamic style uh, where the, the line of the calligraphy brush is, is very expressive um, and full of action. And the facial expressions as well are really emotive. And that's where I'm, where I'm getting to is the, the, the flipping of the switch was the teacher showed a, 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 a scene from that scroll on the projector. And the basic story is that the monk Myoren has uh, ex excelled so immensely in his practice that he's capable of superhuman powers like telekinesis. And so, whereas uh, your average monk that doesn't have these skills yet might walk around town with his alms bowl begging for donations, Myoren could send his bowl miles and miles away to various towns and the bowl itself would show up and people would make their donations and then it would zip back to him on the mountain. And uh, one year this miserly fa farmer decides, I'm done donating to this telekinetic monk. I've got my own economic matters to deal with uh, and I'm not doing it. Now he's a pretty well-off farmer and so this is pretty much the result of selfishness and nothing else. And so he turns down the bowl and uh, as much as a bowl can, can talk, it basically says, you know, well, fine. Uh, so the bowl uh, zips over to this rich farmer's granary, uh, the building holding all of his grains, and it elevates it above the ground and zips it back to where the monk Mjoren lives, the entire grain storage building. And the illustration of this scene uh, is so hilarious. Like the expressions of the, of the, uh, the expression of the farmer running after his uh, granary on the verge of tears, reaching after it. And the scenes of the people around him that presumably work on the farm, just kind of a range of confusion and jubilation laughing at this man. Uh, it's one of the best things that I've ever seen in all of art history. And it was this big moment for me of realizing that uh, so many things at once, just how lively and expressive religious art could be. Uh, the fact that you could have humor uh, in the midst of a kind of moralistic tale to this degree. There were so many things about it that are just absolutely stunning. And I, I recommend anyone to look at the, the whole scroll. It's all online. Um, it's just a, a really wonderful art, uh, it's, it's a really wonderful Im image, uh, that scene, and I, it completely 
it, it, it 100% made me want to study Japanese Buddhist art specifically. <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds like it was like, it was definitely a life changing piece for you. And that experience I think is, sounds very similar to what I had in a museum. Um, yeah. But how, how did that lead you to University of Kansas? Like why, why did you choose Uni University of Kansas? I don't think a lot of people realize that a university in the Midwest has one of the most robust East Asian art programs in the United States. Um, so what specifically drew you here? Yeah, it's um, just like you said, it's, it's an incredibly, um, it, it, as an institution, the University of Kansas has one of the largest uh, faculties of East Asian art specialists in, in America, certainly among public institutions. It's a really great, uh, it's a really great bounty. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I did my undergrad at the University of Texas and I wrote my, I wrote my thesis, my undergraduate thesis about a deity in Buddhism named Avalokiteshvara and in Japanese, the name is Kannon. And this is, uh, this deity is a, is a very, it's a, uh, Kannon is a bodhisattva, which is a being destined for enlightenment. And uh, in addition to being a very famous deity in the Buddhist canon, uh, Avalokiteshvara is also a figure that my current advisor, Dr. Sherry Fowler, has focused a lot of her research on. And so as I was preparing my uh, thesis for my undergraduate, uh, for my undergraduate major, I, uh, I came across Dr. Fowler's research quite frequently. Um, and that in combination with my thesis advisor, Dr. Janice Leoshko, telling me when I was uh, looking into different institutions to apply to, that I should look at the University of Kansas uh, and that Sherry, Dr. Sherry Fowler would be a, a great person to work with. That was a, a major factor in me first kind of looking at KU and trying to see where I might fit in there. Uh, another thing that was really important for me was that uh, when I received my acceptance letter from KU, I was invited to a recruiting event to kind of get to know the school, the faculty, the students. And I received a very warm and enthusiastic welcome that made me feel like I was actually not someone on a list of people that they said, you know, this person passes the basic test, but like someone on a human level that the department was interested in having. And I told my brother about that, actually, when I was talking about um, graduate school admissions, uh, I told my brother what was on my mind. And he said, you absolutely need to consider KU very, very seriously if that's the impression you've got, because it, you can get into any institution, but you want to stay at the institution that's going to prove to you, that has proven to you that they're going to actually focus concerted, concerted effort into your development as a scholar, because there are so many opportunities for a university to just kind of let someone in, they pay the tuition, they check all the boxes, but they don't really get a personalized treatment, which I think is essential in a, in a full education is that kind of personal one-on-one -on -one treatment that I, that was a, a major part of my decision to actually come to KU was uh, uh, that, that very, very warm welcome. And uh, the, Kind of hearing from other students at KU that it was a very collegial environment between students. Uh, that's probably the last major factor is that um, I think a lot of graduate school curricula, I mean a lot of graduate school programs are really well known for having a very cutthroat environment among the students uh, and I am not a very confrontational person. I, even if I were, that sounds very unpleasant. And so talking to students at KU, one thing that people said repeatedly to me is that they've never experienced that sort of environment. And so the combination of advisor, the welcome I received, uh, and the very friendly student environment here were all major attractions for me. 
That's great. Um, I, I can say that that's been my experience as well. Uh, I haven't, there's been no cutthroat. Everybody's been very kind. Everybody's been very encouraging and warm. So um, I'm glad that I was drawn to the University of Kansas for pretty much the same reasons that you were. <laughs> and uh, I'm really glad that we were able to both kind of end up here at roughly the same time. Now, are there any yeah, courses so that... that, that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm really curious so are there any courses because i've some of the courses that i've taken have been really interesting things like uh the buddhist art of like buddhist sculpture of japan and there was a course on chinese sculpture which covered everything from sort of indigenous art all the way up to the buddhist art in china um mm -hmm. are there any courses for you that have really stuck out and feel contributed to your current interests um there are so many <laughs> uh there I've been at KU from uh, since the fall semester of 2015, and so I've, I've fit in a lot. Um, I, I, I signed up for something that KU has called the MA to PhD track, which means that you know I'm I'm basically applying to do both in my initial application, and you know stating that that's my plan to stick it stick it through at KU for the entire duration of my graduate uh, career. And I, as a result, I've taken a great number of classes at KU. And I think some of the, some of the classes that I took during my MA career, my master's career that were the most influential to me were probably, there was one that was co-taught by Dr. Fowler and uh, Dr. Marsha Hoffler, who is an inspirational and amazing scholar who I suggest anyone check out. Um, the course is called Sites of Memory and Cultural Heritage in Asia, and it looked at several temples and monuments and palaces or castles across uh, se several Asian countries that um, exist in the popular perception of their surroundings in a, in a manner that is um, kind of identity building. And so that's where the idea of like a site of memory comes to be. Uh, and so that was a really important class for me because it got me to think about not just the things you can find at a place, but the place itself and the uh, integration of these uh, into the landscape as well. So how, what does it mean for a person that lives in the vicinity of a temple that that temple is there and what do the icons that are enshrined at that temple mean and what are all the stories that kind of create this big ongoing narrative of the the place the object and the people and that was that was a very uh informative and uh high impact experience for me because i'm currently without going into too much detail i'm currently going to be doing a site-based approach for my dissertation uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little, but that, that was uh, for both reasons of, you know, familiarizing myself with theory and methodologies and also just different artworks and places. That was a very important seminar. And then another one that came to mind when you asked me that question was a seminar I took in 2017, which was called Crafts in Japan, Materials, Making and Meaning. And that was another co-taught seminar between KU faculty and uh, Dr. Christine Guth, who is uh, just a Japanese art history rock star. Uh, and uh, she, she very kindly came for several cl classes to KU and, and shared her research with us. And the entire premise of the class uh, was built on a deeper appreciation of the materiality of things. Um, and in addition to that, we looked at objects as things with agency uh, that kind of had their own life to them. Uh, and that was something that I had had on my mind kind of here and there for a year or so before that seminar, but I didn't really understand fully what I was thinking about. And that was a really important class for helping me understand and learn further about the idea of an object 
while not, you know, literally being, you know, animated necessarily, though there are many myths and legends where you do see a literally animated object doing things. Um, but in my own kind of scholarly practice, appreciating the ways in which an image becomes something or someone that is, uh, you know, has a personal presence uh, or a person-like presence in the lives of perhaps a worshiper or a scholar even. And just what does that mean for an object to have agency and to have express expression uh, and interactive capabilities? So those are two big ones for me. I could go on and on if you want. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's really interesting. Now, a lot of these objects with agency, as you call them, um, a lot of them can be found in museum collections across the um, United States and across the world. Um, you've worked as an intern at some, or some of these institutions. And so how does the intern experience augment the student experience in your mind? So it's 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 an incredibly uh, valuable experience i can say immediately i highly even if a person doesn't want to go into museum work i think that it's an invaluable experience for that that person if they study art history to try to get some sort of uh position at a museum at some point in their lives because i mean um on the most obvious face uh there is on the most obvious level there is for example the access to objects which you don't necessarily have when you're a student it really depends on the institutional relationship between your department and your university's museum if your university has a museum uh, and so there are a lot of things that can kind of alienate the art history student from the images that they're so interested in, in learning about. And so working at a museum, be it your school museum or a distant summer internship, anything really, that's a great way to have a kind of one-on-one -on -one and in more intimate relationship with artworks, which is really cool. And I couldn't recommend it more, um, but it's also, if you are interested in going into museum work, it's also a, a really wonderful way to pick up a lot of practical professional skills in a variety of skill sets as well. So picking up uh, information about how to do the type of research that you would do to put on an exhibition. So kind of organizing your research more along sort of the important thematic lines of the exhibition, or the sort of voice of the artist or the kind of, or the culture that the museum may be trying to highlight at that certain point. Um, and also finding ways to make that research digestible to someone who has not decided to spend their entire life studying this information or this culture. And so finding ways to make that accessible and interesting to audiences while also sticking to the facts of the matter, uh, that's a really important skill that I'm still trying to develop. Um, it's, a, it's a lifelong task. But also, there are things like art handling, which, I mean, as Michael, you could tell anyone, is a very specialized skill set. Uh, both art handling and exhibitions are... are, are uh, uh, professional areas that require a lot of technical know-how and uh, it's I'm scratching the surface with my uh, experience in art handling because as of now I'm mostly familiar with how to uh, responsibly handle works on paper so things like prints uh, or illustrations photography even um, and uh, ceramics so you know, if it were anything else, I would actually ask someone to help me out with responsibly handling something because I wouldn't have had that kind of prior knowledge yet for, for like to understand what the safe things to do are, what the absolutely unsafe things to do are. Um, so I would say that those are some big, um, some, some big pluses. And then also more archival things and more database based things. Um, so I've been able to kind of 
I've been able to, at the, I have my current internship that I'm doing at the Spencer Museum of Art, which is the University of Kansas's museum. I'm working on a kind of combination cataloging and um, research project where I'm going through the Japanese ceramics in the collection and kind of filling in the gaps uh, in the archival information and also, you know, helping with things like taking measurements, organizing photo sessions and uh, writing potential labels and things like that. And so um, it's been a really great experience in part because I am now a lot more familiar with the database that the museum uses and partly because I have a greater sense of literacy as to how things are discussed in the sort of, um, in the context of in the organization of information, which is, it's uh, really important for the museum world to have that sort of understanding as I'm learning every day. <laughs> What I find really interesting about what you just mentioned is you talked about a little bit about the accessibility of um, information about a piece um, and how it can be understood by the audience. And then you also talked about um, the handling on your own end. What about the sort of fusion of the two together? How does the handling of the object, how does that help you write about the object? It's, it's so helpful. I mean, short of, um just the most glossy, crisp photos in the world. There's, there's um, the, dif the difference between actually being able to handle or just be in the presence of something that you're researching or writing about. There's a light years of difference between that and having to look at a photo of that object because you miss so much depth and dimension and so many of the fine details that, uh, can kind of make or break an analysis. I, I think it's it's just it's I, every ch every chance I get to write about something that I can actually be with, uh, in order to complete that research, I feel so much more confident in my ability to connect with the image and to kind of do notice the nitty gritty details that can add new depth to the kind of life of that object. Um, it, it, it basically gives you the opportunity to investigate in a way that a two-dimensional photograph, even if it's a very well done photograph, uh, it, it gives you so much more investiga investiga investigative uh, skills, basically. Yeah, and uh, it's amazing because, like you said, there are a lot of institutions in the United States that have a lot of incredible Japanese works of art, sculpture, um, prints, paintings, what have you. And there are so many opportunities for students like you and I to be able to go into those institutions and see them in person. They are, of course, going to be behind glass, but with, a, with express permission from curators, there is an opportunity to go into the back rooms and see these things in person and even have an opportunity to touch them. Mm -hmm. um, but no matter how exhaustive the collections are here in American collections, there is no doubt, there's no argument that the biggest place and the best place to see Japanese art is in Japan itself. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that you actually had an opportunity to go to Japan in person and spend a lot of time there and see a lot of these objects up close in person at temples, at museums. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah, I'll probably end up telling you too much. <laughs> um, I was, uh, I've been to Japan on three occasions for, uh, two of them were for summer programs and one of them was for a full year program. They're all language learning programs. So um, in, my, in my undergraduate uh, career, I went to Japan during the summer of, I wanna say 2014 for a program called um, CET, which is, uh, it allows students to study at a school in Osaka, which is a wonderful city if you like fun, warm people and good food. Uh, and it's also a wonderful city if you like uh, culture. And there are really, it's, it's not only is it well situated in terms of other cities with important cultural monuments, but Osaka itself is a great place to visit for 
temples. They have a wonderful ceramics museum. Um, the, I could go on. Um, and then the other two times I've been to Japan were for a program called IUC, which is in Yokohama. And that's in a very different part of Japan, which is uh, similarly full of culture and, and bubbling with fun things to do. And uh, the, the importance of language study for art history cannot be understated. And so that's kind of why I was basically going to Japan for specifically to work on my language so many times is that you can really never be too good at your research language. And so I, every single time I've been in Japan, unfortunately it has been as a student though. And so I always have my obligations such as homework and attending class that limit me and my abilities. But even so I've done everything that I could to schedule trips to other cities to see art uh, or scheduling just little day trips. So for example, when I lived in Osaka, it was very easy to visit Nara or Kyoto and kind of look at um, the centuries worth, really only scrape the surface of the centuries worth of uh, culture that has kind of developed in these towns. And so Places like uh, Todaiji in, in Nara, where you can see the Great Buddha, for example, or um, in Kyoto, just, <laughs> I've, I've spent so much time in Kyoto, pers like on a personal level, and also because anytime someone visited me when I was in Japan, they immediately wanted to go to Kyoto. And so I've been there so many times, and I've been to the same several temples that all you know, first time visitors to Japan really want to go to like, uh, I don't know, Kiyomizu Dera or Sanju Sangendo uh, are all really uh, highly recommended places uh, by me and by the people that visited me. Um, so I'm, I just realized I got so excited talking about all of the places that I've been and kind of getting nostalgic about it that I'm, I've kind of gone off on a tangent. But... <laughs> So um, I think the, the place that um, was perhaps the most, um, the most meaningful for me to visit was actually a, a place I've been to twice. And it's a, it's a temple complex called Koya-san or Mount Koya, um, which is uh, if you take a, a train and a bus out of Osaka or Kyoto for that matter, you'll get there with, uh, without too many without too much occasion. And it's the headquarters, uh, one of the headquarters, I should say, because uh, if I called it the one headquarters of Shingon Buddhism, I think Toji would be kind of mad at me. <laughs> but um, it's one of the headquarters of a branch of Buddhist practice called Shingon Buddhism, which uh, is true word, uh, literally. Um, if you've heard the word uh, mantra, in, in your life, that is the, the Japanese word mantra is, is Shingon. I'm sorry, the Japanese word for mantra is Shingon, but it's also the name of this uh, massively important school in, um, in what one would call esoteric Buddhism in, 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 Japanese, in a Japanese context. And uh, without going too much into the nitty gritty of, of all that, it's, it's, a, it's a tradition that's full of very detailed, colorful, expressive uh, images of deities. And the, the cosmos of Shingon Buddhism covers not only perhaps the more serene images of Buddhas or Bodhisattvas that someone might be more familiar with, but also a range of wrathful deities with many arms and heads and legs. And it's a really, um, Koyasan itself is, is a massive uh, repository of, of images such as these. And I actually went to Koyasan on a field trip during that program in Osaka that I mentioned earlier and didn't really, I, at, I was at a point in my Japanese education at which my most recent achievement was that I had learned a verb conjugation form that allows you to put two verbs in a row. And so I was not good at Japanese at all. I could barely understand what was going on around me. But um, we went to this beautifully still mountain 
that was just trees as far as the eye could see and you know immersed among these trees were uh, various temples along a kind of main stretch that's integrated also into a sort of a, a small town that sort of functions around the temple complex and it's home to uh, the the mausoleum of the Japanese, the founder of Shingon in Japan, uh, a, a, a teacher named Kukai, or posthumously, he also received the title Kobo Daishi, Great Dharma Spreading Master. And um, Kobo Daishi was um, a very important figure for multiple reasons, both public and religious. And um, his mausoleum is said to house not his dead body, but his body that is in a constant state of meditation, essentially. And so it's it's kept in a part of the temple complex called the Okunolin. And surrounding the Okunolin is a cemetery filled with thousands upon thousands of graves. Some of them are ancient, predating even, you know, the complex itself. And some of them are very modern. And it's a very fashionable place for a wealthy person to be buried right now um, or for someone to build a monument. But there's uh, so much old and new going on at Mount Koya and even in my state of knowing almost no Japanese, I was just really floored by my experience visiting Koya-san and it is um, coincidentally one of the grave types that you see throughout Koyasan and other Japanese grave sites uh, is called a gorinto. It's a five layered shape that um, is packed with all sorts of uh, symbolic meaning. The, the five shapes all represent, five is a very powerful number in Buddhism, especially in Shingon. And it uh, the five shapes that build this kind of vertical um, grave marker actually uh, also stand for five cosmic Buddhas, five colors, five organs, um, many other groups of five that um, are very um, that make it a very powerful image that literally embodies the things that it signifies. Um, and it, it wasn't just a grave marker. It was also, uh, it, it's a shape that often appears as a, as a vessel for relics, uh, which is a, a reliquary, that is. And so I, little did I know visiting Koyasan for the first time that um, I was surrounded by a shape that was going to become a very interesting research topic for me. And so, uh, Michael, you've, <laughs> you've known me for a year, and I'm sure the Gorinto has come up uh, at least 20 times. Um, but it's a really, it was a really important moment for multiple reasons. It inspired in me my interest in Shingon, my interest in funerary culture, my interest in the Gorinto as a shape. And uh, last, the last time I went to Japan, which was for the IUC full year program in uh, 2017 to 18, I was actually able to do a temple stay overnight at Koyasan. And it was a version of me that was a lot better at Japanese. So I was able to take in a lot more information and actually talk to monks um, and uh, engage in a meditative class for Ajikan meditation. It was at a very beginner level, obviously, but it was very meaningful. And uh, yeah, I just, there's something about going to Koyasan that like, if I could go there, if I could just teleport there right now, I, I would be completely at peace. That is amazing. And you said that Koyasan is just like a receptacle, it's a repository for thousands of images. Mm -hmm. And do you find that there is a difference between looking at those artworks in situ as opposed to something you might see in a museum behind glass? I do. I really love museums and I want to work at museums. And so this is not a, a critique so much as an explanation of the kind of the difference in, in, the, f the feeling of, of looking at an artwork in a museum, and it's called an artwork with a capital A, and going to a temple where an image is enshrined on an altar and it's surrounded by the, 
um, the, the implements of prayer. So perhaps incense, flowers, uh, offerings, well, flowers and incense are two types of offerings, but other types of offerings uh, could include things like food even. And it's the, the, the lighting in a temple, the dim, the dim space that you're in that's, you know, augmented by candlelight and the flickering of the candlelight against the gold of a, of a Buddha's uh, body, for example, um, the smell of incense in the air. It's, it's an experience that from multiple kind of sensory angles just grasps you in a way that is different from being in a museum, which is more of a kind of, a museum acts more as a kind of index of human achievement, for example. And so, you know, that's why a lot of them organize their exhibition spaces along a certain culture at a certain time period, for example, because that's why people are going to museums in part is to say, I don't know much about Japan in the 12th century, or maybe I don't know much about Japan at all. What can I learn by going to this museum that has a lot of Japanese art? How can I learn to better um, understand this visual tradition by, or honestly, these visual traditions, because there are many, many one, there are many, many of them in Japan. Um, how can I better learn, uh, learn to understand these visual traditions by experiencing them in person? And that's incredibly important in and of itself. The fact that a museum allows you to go look at an object and be in its presence is so important by itself. Uh, but uh, there's, there's, it's, it's kind of got um, a more perhaps academic or not academic, but mm, it, it, an object in a museum becomes more of an object of study than an object of perhaps um, uh, adoration. Um, and, and it's not to say that those two spheres cannot merge because there are actually numerous examples reported in um, newspapers and journals uh, that uh, tell of people going to museums, for example, in Japan and seeing a Buddhist icon that is out on display and, you know, bowing or giving a kind of maybe a coin as an offering. And I've personally seen this as well. I've, I've been to a very, very busy exhibit of the, um, that was put on at the Tokyo National Museum. And it was uh, this big retrospective on uh, Unke, who is uh, uh, a very important sculptor uh, of <clears throat> in Japanese history. Um, the kind of, let me get my numbers straight, the 12th to the 13th centuries. Um, and, uh, I, I really hate doing cultural projections, but one thing that kind of comes up a lot is people say, oh, he's the Michelangelo of Japanese sculptors, but you could more accurately say that Michelangelo is the unke of Italian sculptors because Michelangelo did not live until centuries later, I believe. Anyway, um, <laughs> so he's a, a massively important figure and his images are living proof because they are so they are so serene and beautiful, or they are so emotive and lively. Um, and there's a, a, a true realism to them that even though you know they're wood, you doubt that they're wood. They're very amazing sculptures. And I was so lucky to be in Japan during this exhibit, but um, I was uh, walking around this packed exhibition hall. I had to wait in a very long line to get in. Um, and I saw, a, uh, I saw a person kind of do a very you know, reverent bow and people made a little bit of room for them to do that, which I thought was really considerate and uh, left a coin. And this is something that gets documented uh, as happening in front of Buddhist images all over not just Japan, but also there are instances of this happening in America as well. And sometimes the institution welcomes this, sometimes it doesn't, but uh, it's something that happens. And so this is also just proof of the power that the image has on its own of drawing in a worshiper uh, in spite of the kind of stripped down surroundings. 
But with all that said and done, it is in every sensation that a body can feel, it is a different experience to, to encounter an icon at a temple, in my opinion, than um, it is uh, in a museum, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, you are talking with such enthusiasm, you're touching, talking with such excitement about the topic. And I get this feeling that you will bring that passion to the dissertation topic that you decide for your doctoral um, degree as well. And mm. can you talk a little bit about your dissertation topic and how that might excite you as well? Yeah, um, I can I can give you a little sneak peek. <laughs> um, it's it's a it's an idea that is in formation, which is part of the reason I'm being a little bit coy. But um, I mentioned earlier that I'd like to do a site based study, um, which uh, to to deconstruct the jargon there basically just means that I'm focusing on a specific uh, place or institution and um, perhaps taking a specific angle on that focus, I'm writing my dissertation about that. Um, so that involves, uh, that will hopefully involve field work, which means I'm going to the institution and um, making connections there, getting permission before I do anything. Uh, and once that permission is hopefully achieved, uh, studying images uh, in an up close manner and looking at rec uh, records that the temple might have in its collection, for example. And in addition to that field work on site, also visiting archival institutions uh, in Japan mostly, because those are the best places to get Japanese archives. Um, and kind of also hopefully building institutional relationships at uh, archival uh, museums and college libraries, places like that. Um, and so for my dissertation specifically, there is a temple called Daigoji in Kyoto, which uh, I would like to study from the perspective of uh, imperial patronage, um, looking at imperial patronage and looking at the ways in which um, images, worship images and temples themselves uh, establish relationships with uh, both the monks that arrange rituals and uh and commission uh and commission um sorry i'm gonna go back uh, i misspoke um so uh the relationships between uh, an, an icon and the monks that arrange rituals for these icons as well as the uh secular or lay people that uh attend or donate to the temple um, and the, the ways in which relationships between images and lineages of people can shape over time and both respond to and uh, also create new narratives um, in, in the history of the area, uh, both locally and on a, on a more national scale, uh, since I'm dealing with the imperial family, uh, if they'll have me. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to, to treat the images and the temples as places that are active builders of history and builders of relationships. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, event you're essentially gonna become kind of the keeper of the knowledge about this specific temple site. And uh, you're going to be also talking with monks who themselves are protectors of the artifacts and protectors of the Dharma centered around that area as well. That's yeah. that's really exciting. I, I hope that I get to that. That you made it sound really really cool, and I hope I get to that <laughs> level. Um, if again, if they will have me, because there's also, I mean, I'm sure this will come as a surprise to no one, mm. but a, a researcher that is approaching an institution of religion needs to also be respectful uh, and mindful of the practitioners that they are kind of asking, please, can I look at this? Please, can I, is there a way that I can look at this that respects your uh, religious practice, uh, that respects the importance uh, and the um, agency of these icons uh, in the history of this temple, for example. It's, uh, it's something that I, I hope I do well at because it's an essential skill for anyone looking at any religious material culture. 
Oh, absolutely. And as a curator in the future, you're going to have to do the same thing as well. You're going to have to be very mindful about the way that you approach pieces of art, um, how you present that information. And I understand that you already have a little bit of curatorial experience as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I kind of mentioned summer intro internships earlier in our conversation and, um, I actually had the great fortune of, uh, of, receiving, uh, of, of, of being chosen for an internship at the Ringling Museum, which is a, a museum of not only art, but also of, of circus material culture, because it is located in Sarasota, Florida. And it was founded by uh, one of the Ringling brothers uh, of, of famous, of circus royalty. And, um, <laughs> In addition to being a devoted, uh, you know, circus family, uh, the Ringlings had manifold interests on a more personal level. And and John and Mabel Ringling happened to be avid art collectors. And when uh, when John Ringling passed away, one of the most important goals for him was that his art collection would maintain as a museum that was accessible to. Uh, a wide range of, of visitors and not just something that would kind of be broken up and sold in estate sales and things like that. And so the Ringling Museum in Sarasota had me in the summer of 2019 for a, uh, a summer internship in their curatorial department. And uh, in addition to looking at really amazing prints and uh, sculpture uh, of, of various uh, Japanese time periods. Um, and I was, uh, I should also say prints and ceramics from various uh, Japanese time periods. I was also really lucky to, uh, that my, my supervisor actually gave me the project of organizing an installation at the museum. And so one of the, uh, one of the kind of genres of, of art that the Ringling Museum has uh, an abundance of is a type of ceramics called, uh, it's, it's, it's a type of porcelain that is called uh, de huaware, which uh, that name ref ref uh, refers to the county in Fujian province from, uh, from which the ceramics come, but also, because this uh, type of ceramics became incredibly popular in, in uh, Europe and America for a period of time, it also has picked up a French name, and that is Blanc de Chine, uh, which means white of China, uh, or white from China, which refers to the white coloration of porcelain itself, but also of these objects, because one thing that distinguishes uh, de Huawei uh, is the fact that it is most commonly completely white ware. So they make a vessel or they make a sculpture and then they glaze it in such a way that shows off both the um, very, uh, the very kind of uniform and uh, very elegant shade of white that this porcelain has naturally, as well as the beauty of the glaze that is used to um, kind of color it, not color it, but augment it. it. It has this very beautiful glossiness to it. And depending on um, the chemical makeup of the clay, the chemical makeup of the glaze, the uh, heat of the kiln when everything was fired in different stages, and even just the weather that day, uh, glaze can pick up kind of slightly different hues as well. And so sometimes you get a sort of bluish hue Sometimes you'll get a very faint pinkish hue, but it's, um, it's something that connoisseurs get really uh, heated about. And um, this was my first, uh, this was not only a really exciting opportunity because I was able to put together an exhibition, but also because I was able to dive into something that I have maybe a, um, a basic advantage over the average person when it comes to the Huawei's because I make ceramics myself, so I have a lot of technical understanding that helped me there. And then also a basic familiarity with um, Chinese history, religious movements in China, and um, also kind of economic and political movements in China that helped me contextualize the history of the Huawei 
wears, but also um, it was nonetheless an, an experience that allowed me to really dive into something that I had limited familiarity with prior to the experience. And um, I really, I, I loved every second of it because I was able to, from the from the ground uh, up, I was able to build something. Um, hold on a sec. Hey, sweetie, could you not with the sound? It's okay, sweetie. Sorry. Um, so from the ground up, I was able to build an exhibit that um, approached the artwork from angles that I thought was important, for example. And so uh, the installation itself is called Porcelains of De Hua from Regional Kilns to Global Markets. And I really wanted to emphasize not only the um, kind of localized importance of De Hua wares, which developed um, on the local level in De Hua as, a, as a, an independent porcelain tradition, um, apart from some of the others that people might be more familiar with. For example, when people say China, they might envision what is called blue and white wares. Uh, and uh, there are also traditions of using, uh, for example, um, like celadon glazes, a very kind of pleasant green clear glaze. Uh, that's something that's kind of ubiquitous or well known for Chinese uh, ceramic traditions. But the hua wares are uh, famous in not only for their coloration, but also for the very, um, in the best examples, you have an incredibly elaborate and fine degree of detail that um, part of the reason it's able to exist in these artworks is because of the quality, the chemical, comp the chemical composition of the clay and the glaze means that you can do a really, really fine, uh, a really fine intricate detail and when that object goes into the kiln to be fired at some 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, more actually, it, it doesn't warp or lose its shape. It's, it's actually one of the biggest nightmares of anyone who has to run the kiln that something could lose its uh, initial form and kind of warp in strange ways. Uh, that did not exist in the original piece uh, before it went into the kiln, that um, that's a big nightmare for anyone running the kiln. And so the, um, the, the quality of, of uh, the Hua wares to be really, really fine and detailed, but also maintain that shape after being fired is something that it's really famous for and that results from the local uh, the composition, the mineral composition of local clay and uh, and mineral repositories, and so it's it's uh, it was really I, I learned a lot on a technical level about uh, the the de Hua wares, but also I got to learn a lot about local religion as well because in de Hua it's uh, it's basically a, it's a it's a maritime area and so deities related to maritime safety to mercantilism are especially uh apparent in de hua imagery and um in addition to making a lot of vessels that could be used for scholarly practice for example uh de hua ware has a really rich tradition of making icons for buddhist and taoist contexts and also um for the the merging of these contexts as well it's someone doesn't necessarily only have buddhist images in their house or only have taoist images in their house there can be a kind of uh, fluidity to these things um, and so one of the really exciting things for me about putting this exhibit together was also just um, learning about taoism more than i had known before because many of the chinese buddhist manifestations of uh, deities were familiar to me even though they had different names but um, there was so much to, to to dive into with Taoism and I again I only just you know saw the tip of the iceberg and I'm excited to to learn more as I progress through my studies but um, yeah it was it was really exciting to kind of have that level of agency in my own curatorial practices and to say okay here's the type of image that I'm going to work with, but I get to say which pieces go into the exhibit, uh, 
how I'm going to examine them, what I'm going to focus on, and even down to you know the color of the the cloth in the uh, exhibition space. I was able to kind of say, you know, I think that this color uh, is going to work really well with the whiteness of the glazes, for example. And of course, that that color that I chose was um, the result of working with someone who knows a lot better than me, uh, someone in the exhibition uh, department, in the exhibitions department, uh, who helped me along the way. But just the fact that I was able to have a voice in that conversation was something that was so new to me. And then, of course, writing every single label. <laughs> um, every single label in that show is my work. And there's a sense of immense pride that goes to that. Um, when when people learn about something, it's because I was able to have this opportunity to present it to them. Essentially, it's it's an immense honor to to kind of put out the platform through which someone who maybe has never seen an image of, uh, for example, Guanyin. Um, Guanyin Protector of the Seas, which is my favorite, I think one of my favorite pieces in that show, because it's Guanyin standing very elegantly on this beautiful swirling orb of water. Um, and just every bit of it makes me feel so at ease. Um, the, the fact that someone's seeing that for the first time is then going to see, you know, things that I found out through my research and kind of put together uh, by working with all of my wonderful colleagues at the Ringling, that was a really amazing experience. Yeah. And here's hoping that you're going to be able to keep that trajectory going for your foreseeable career. That's really exciting. And I hope that you have many opportunities in the future. Yeah, I hope I can. I haven't actually been able to see it because so much goes into actually putting a show together that um, my internship, which was 10 weeks long, wrapped up and I had to go back to Kansas where <laughs> I am a student. And so the show actually was all completed and put up uh, in March, which for obvious reasons, going to uh, any other state in America right now is, is uh, full of complications um, because of COVID, but I still haven't been able to see it. But They've all sent me pictures and um, it was just it, so I, I kind of teared up looking at the pictures of the show because I almost didn't believe in it at a certain point because I was like, I was so separated from the museum uh, over the school year and mm -hmm. just seeing the photos of the show up really got me. <laughs> no, I, I, can, I have no doubt whatsoever. So during this conversation we've had, I, you know, I'm very grateful that we've had this time to talk. Um, you've presented so much information. Um, you've detailed your excitement for talking about all this stuff. You've really highlighted a lot of interesting fields and interesting areas of research that people could go down if they want to. What are some, can you give me five essential books in understanding your field of research um, mm. along with authors? <laughs> Um, yes, but it's not, it, 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 I don't think I can do like a kind of monolithic, like okay. for the ages, but what I could definitely do is give some books that have really inspired me and the trajectory I'm on right now. That's um, even better. Even better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, uh, there's a scholar named Cynthia Bogle who has written a lot about uh, the the way that Shingon religion impacted the social and material and political landscape of uh, Japan at the period that it was introduced to Japan in the early ninth century, and um, her book with a single glance is uh, very. Uh, it's a very complex but very important examination of these relationships between various uh, people in Japan uh, in, the, in the Heian period, which uh, is the, the period in question for the introduction of, uh, of Shingon to J Japan, um, and the, the images and rituals that are connected to those images uh, that uh, came about. 
in, um, in, in, as a result of that new uh, burgeoning relationship. And so that was, um, that was and continues to be a very uh, important read for me. I'm always going back to it when I, when I uh, am, when I have things on my mind, I'm always going back to it to kind of see what new inspiration I can glean from, from Dr. Bogle. Um, so that is Cynthia Bogle, and the title of the book is? Mm -hmm. With a Single Glance. With a Single Glance. Yeah. Um, then there's a book that uh, you and I were speaking about recently with our colleague called Buddhist Materiality, which is by Fabio Rambelli. And um, this book does a lot. So I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to assume that I could really encapsulate it fully in a, in a, in a, in a blurb, but it, a lot of the things I was talking about earlier with the animation and the agency of an icon and, and not just an icon uh, in, in, in terms of what Rambelli is looking at, but um, ritual implements in general in, in uh, Buddhism and with more of a focus on Shingon in this book, um, they have a life to them. They have, um, a personality to them and this book not only talks about the like a vast array of ritual implements that exist in buddhism but also the philosophical or theological discourses that are going on between monks at different periods of japanese history talking about you know is a tree sentient if a tree is sentient what are the ramifications of that on a broader scale for example uh, these are all things that, um, going back to the idea of materiality and the importance of, you know, the object itself um, in, in Japan and in Buddhism, these are questions that really help understand, help a person have a clearer understanding of the relationship between an object and the person who made it, the relationship between an object and the person who commissions it. Uh, or asks for it to be made, that is, and the relationship between that object and all of the people who ever use it or interact with it um, and encounter it in any way. And so it's a really exciting uh, book from that perspective, I think. Yeah. Very nice. Well, I really am grateful that we've had this time to talk, and I really thank you for joining me. Um, and thank you for having me. <laughs> and a big thank you to Greg for allowing us this opportunity to talk on his podcast. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Streibig. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email me at classicalideas at outlook.com. Or find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash classical ideas podcast. Thanks so much for listening.